good afternoon, everybody, and it really is a great pleasure to be here. And thank you all for, for joining us. I, uh, I'm really uh, looking forward to exploring with you today some of the connections uh, in 1915 between uh, the Western Front and the wider world, and more particularly, uh, a few days in the life of the Indian Army in 1915 as part of the British Expeditionary Force, or BEF, on the Western Front. And through the lens of those days, I hope we can see clearly some aspects of, of global war. But before we turn to those days in 1915, and to be precise, five of them, I'd like to bear in mind a little background uh, before we uh, get going on, on the days. So today I want to look at five days in particular that can help us uh, think about the Western Front uh, from a point of view of trying to connect it with the wider world. And before we get there, I would like to remember a few numbers that I think are important to think about uh, as background. And we should remember that as part of the British First World War effort from 1914 to 1918, there was a grand total of one and a half million Indians who served in the Indian Army under some 10,000 uh, British officers. And here on my first slide, uh, the picture, we had some of these Indians on the move uh, in the Middle East towards the end of the war. And to put that grand total of one and a half million Indian servicemen in perspective, it was more than 1918's total of Australian, New Zealander, South African, Canadian and Caribbean servicemen combined. Or well, to put it another way, there was one Indian Army soldier to every four British Army soldiers. Now to dive a bit deeper into that grand total of one and a half million Indian troops, it's significant that only a small minority of them served on the Western Front. That's approximately 9%. And an even smaller minority of them served on the Western Front in 1915. That's around 5%. And this, of course, means that the vast majority of the First World War's Indian servicemen, at least 90%, did not serve on the Western Front. And with that in mind, we need, it seems to me, to be quite careful about how we might see Indian Western Front service as general, typical, or broadly representative of the Indian war experience. And following from that thought, I think there's an interesting question to ask today. And this is how might events in what we can call majority Indian war experience beyond the Western Front, meaning elsewhere in Europe and in Asia and Africa, and to an extent at sea, help us understand the Western Front better? In other words, if here is the Western Front, what happened out there in the wider world that can give us new insights about the Western Front? And addressing that question, I'd like this afternoon to share with you just a few ideas to indicate how profoundly I think we can understand the Indian Western Front experience by tracing its connections uh, with the wider world. And I'd suggest, just before we get going on those five days, that the helpful foundation for tracing that kind of connection is to think of a particular global network. And this map here uh, is from my recent book, Gary mentioned, uh, The Indian Empire at War, which tells uh, the Indian soldiers global story in the Great War. And this map here is from the book. And I, I just use it here as a brief indication of how widely spread the Indian troops were uh, between 1914 and 1918. Now, what I mean by talking of a global network is to try to see the Indian troops in France and Belgium as outliers at the Northwest Europe extremities of a global network of Indian armed forces. The global network is, is something we can think of here as containing all one and a half million Indian troops in 1914 to 1918, with the numerous fronts where they served. So that's from, from France, Greece and Gallipoli to Palestine, Egypt, Cameroon, East Africa, Iraq, China and elsewhere. And think of these fronts joined together in all sorts of ways. We can think of these fronts where Indians served as joined together by thousands of miles of roads, railway lines and shipping lanes on which men and supplies were constantly on the move. We can think of these fronts as joined together by official electrical signals or messaging flashing along telegraph cables on land or the ocean floor. Or we can think of these fronts as joined together by millions of letters, postcards and reports that move between all the fronts to and from or to and fro all the time pretty much between family, friends or colleagues. And all the while, the great hub of this global network I'm describing of fronts and communications 
was India as a land of 315 million people under British control, formerly known at the time as the India Empire. And with its recruitment grounds, regimental depots, garrison towns, and war material supply chains, all playing their parts to sustain the fight at the fronts. So it's with this, this network I've described in mind that I want to come back now uh, to 1915. And this afternoon, I'm going to focus on the Indian infantry in particular on the Western Front as plugged into this network, which in 1915 was very much in an emerging state. And as you, as you perhaps know, and I'm sure many of you do, uh, the Indian infantry on the Western Front formed the bulk of two divisions that made up the BEF's Indian Corps within the British First Army in France. The Indian Corps, in fact, contained well under half of the total of Indians who served on the Western Front. And that's because the Indian Corps was distinct from several other bodies of Indian servicemen that went to France, such as the Indian Cavalry Corps or the Indian Labour Corps. But for now, as I said, our focus today is on the Indian Corps, that's the Indian Infantry, and how we can understand then the Indian Corps through thinking about connections with the wider world. As I mentioned, I'm going to explore with you today a few days in the life of the Indian Army in 1915 as part of the BEF. And the events of each of those days, I think, can help us show uh, different sorts of things according uh, to the day. So uh, to start with, we have these men here. And we're looking at the 3rd of March, 1915. Now, it's the early morning of 3rd of March, about 1 a.m., and all's dark on the Indian Corps' front in the First Army sector in northeastern France. A British officer named John Tancred of an elite Indian regiment, the 58th Bourne's Rifles, was doing a routine round of his Indian company's trenches. He was crawling in the moonlight in no man's land to check on an isolated forward post held by seven Indian troops. And all of these men were long serving professionals and some of his best men. But when Tancred was out there looking in no man's land and he went up to the isolated post, none of the seven were there. He hadn't, he hadn't heard a sound from their direction that just disappeared. So the officer Tancred scrambled back and immediately called for a particular Indian officer who like all Indian officers held his own special Indian officer rank, meaning he was officially subordinate to any British officer. And this particular Indian officer is this man on the slide here. I hope you can see him clear enough on the left. He was called Mia Mast and he, and he had been decorated uh, for bravery against the Germans uh, in 1914. So on this uh, early morning of the 3rd of March, 1915, in the First Army trenches, uh, the, the, the officer Tancred told Mir Mas to go out and find the missing men and bring them back. And he picked up Mir Mas because he thought if there's one man who could talk the missing men into returning, it must be Mir Mas, who was a charismatic man, a company leader, who always seemed to his British officers to set an excellent example of reliability. And this was the start of an extraordinary sequence of, event, of events involving Mir Mas. He was in fact the mastermind of the single largest known Indian group desertion on the Western Front. And the, and the meticulous planning of this desertion led by Mir Mast uh, soon unfurled on the 3rd of March, 1915. So that in all, Mir Mast led two dozen of his men in going over to the Germans. And without, within, within hours, Mir Mast and his men were behind German lines being interrogated by German military intelligence in a fortress at Lille. Now, this desertion uh, by the group led by Mir Mast in 1915 uh, is important for us today because of what it shows us about the personal thoughts or feelings of the Indian troops as individuals. Now, this is a virtually limitless subject, and we're only going to touch on it uh, briefly uh, today or very briefly. But it's vital to remember that the Indians' war experience was as colonial subjects. Now, the British like to see the Indian soldier as a colonial subject. And they, they, they looked at the Indian soldier in particular as somebody they viewed as usually recruited from a rural community with low levels of literacy. And, seeing, and they saw the Indian soldier as somebody kept separate day to day in military life from thoughts or politics that might encourage the Indian soldier or lead him to commit acts of anti British resistance. And in keeping with this sort of mentality, there was a British Court of Inquiry held on the Western Front in March 1915, including some of the most senior officers. And the inquiry looked into the group desertion led by Mir Mas and tried to work out what had caused it. And they came to the conclusion that the desertion was caused by an internal regimental grievance 
a grievance centering on one of the deserters apparently having been overlooked for promotion to become an Indian officer. So the inquiry saw the cause of the desertion really as personal peak uh, within a politically sealed regimental or micro environment. And the inquiry that looked into the desertions denied the idea that there was any bigger or wider motivation on the deserters' minds. However, if we look into the wider world in 1915, I think we can start piecing together a slightly different story. So in 1915, a small but nevertheless significant number of Indian troops uh, decided to turn against uh, the British. For example, in Burma, the 130th Baluch uh, Regiment mutinied. Uh, at Singapore, the 5th Light Inter Infantry, another Indian regiment mutinied. And across the fronts in 1915, there were some Indian troops who deserted, including in Iraq and Egypt. And also across the fronts, at garrisons and elsewhere, there were a few incidents of Indian soldiers who attacked their British officers, on occasion murdering them. The evidence of the circumstances of each of these and other acts of Indian, Indian soldier resistance in 1915 clearly indicates multiple acts of resistance against British treatment of the Indian soldier as a colonial subject involving protest against unequal terms of service compared with British uh, or white troops. This suggests that acts of anti-colonial struggle could be found far and wide amongst the Indian army in 1915. And new evidence about mere mass desertion in France shows how his actions amounted to much more than the British concluded at the time. So archival evidence from Germany and India of mere mass own words reveals that a primary cause of his desertion was his disgust at British unequal treatment of him as an Indian officer. In his words after he deserted, as reported by a British Secret Service informant, and these are what Mirmas uh, said, that commanding your own regiment is an honor and privilege you can never get in British service. While explaining his motivations for deserting, Mirmas also talked, for he was a Muslim, of his sense of allegiance to the Turks uh, as an Islamic people who the British were fighting. And that just goes to show how his desertion uh, involves a lot of complex uh, motivations. But the uh, resistance to unequal British treatment uh, was really at the heart of them. And today I won't go into the full story of Mirmast, uh, which involved his entering German service and trying to help start a revolution on the British Indian border with Afghanistan. And his full story is in my uh, recent book, The Indian Empire at War, if you're interested in, uh, in finding out his full story. But anyway, we can either see Mirmast's desertion in March 1915 on the Western Front as a local event like the British in France did at the time, or we can see it in the context of wider Indian acts of resistance to British service. And in this context, Mirmast and other Indian soldiers elsewhere, I think, become more connected. Indeed, the Indian soldiers' huge numbers of letters sent between the Western Front and other fronts, or the home front in India, often mentioned deserters or mutineers, or otherwise uh, questioned British service, at times in code. And all these letters discussing these things about terms of service, uh, mutinies and desertion, uh, really amounted to something of a global conversation going on between the fronts as all these places were linked together uh, by the post. So in 1915, only a small number of Indian soldiers overall may have struck out against the British, but the connections between the acts in different places on the Western Front and elsewhere, you know, prim primarily shared uh, frustrations or rage at their status uh, as colonial uh, subjects. And I think this really indicates how much the feelings of Indian soldiers who did strike out against the British were surely shared in secret uh, by most Indian troops uh, in general. So uh, I'll move on now to uh, the second day I'd like to uh, consider. And that is uh, the 1st of April uh, 1915. So moving forward uh, to, to uh, the next month here, and this is a picture of Marseille we have here. And in particular here is a famous street photographed near the time, the Canavier, leading into the city of Marseille from the old port area. Now, it was up this street on the 1st of April 1915 that an Indian regiment marched, just arrived at Marseille by sea. And that regiment was the 40th Patans. They marched from the port area, playing on Scottish Highland bag bagpipes, the French national anthem. And three weeks later, they would be with the Indian Corps uh, in the trenches of the Eat salient. But the importance of the arrival of the 40th, of the 40th Patans is where uh, they came from. They'd sailed 9,000 miles, 9,000 miles to get to France, 
Uh, that February 1915, they'd been stationed at Hong Kong, where they'd guarded German prisoners of war captured by Allied forces uh, in northern China. And by March, they had sailed from Hong Kong uh, for France via Singapore, and also what's now Sri Lanka, and then through Aden and Alexandria. And the 40th Bataan's journey from Hong Kong to France is a typical example of how the Indian Corps was consistently connected with the world beyond the Western Front. In 1915, it received around 30,000 Indian drafts plus British officers as reinforcements. And these reinforcements journeyed to the Indian Corps from far and wide. All in all, they came either as whole battalions or as companies or as individual drafts from China, India, Burma, Egypt, Gallipoli and elsewhere. All sorts of places where Indian troops were posted and available uh, for redeployment to France. In this way, the original Indian Corps battalions of 1914, numbering uh, 14 battalions or so, were in 1915 reinforced by men of some 50 other Indian battalions, which were originally uh, elsewhere. The Indian Corps has often been written about uh, as if it was a fixed contingent created in 1914 that remained in France in 1915. But in truth, its composition was always in flux because it was so connected uh, with the wider world. Indeed, up to mid-1915, some of the Indian Corps' original Indian battalions were swapped for incoming Indian battalions, with the original Indian units departing from France that summer, including the 4th Gurkhas, who went from France to Gallipoli, uh, and the 15th Sikhs, who went from France to the Western Desert. And of course, the movement of men from the Indian Corps included some Indian wounded from the Western Front who returned home, uh, carrying the first first-hand stories of the Western Front back to their uh, villages and, and uh, on occasion to Indian cities. So all this means uh, that in 1915, we can see a global network of Indian forces emerging in significant part because from the start of 1915, men and units far and wide were on the move to join the Indi Indian Corps in France, while others left the Corps uh, in opposite directions. And uh, this street here on the slide, the Canabier, it really does uh, stand as a symbol of this because I think most Indian soldiers uh, walked up it in 1914 or 1915. And uh, if we move on uh, to the third day I'd like to talk about this afternoon, it's the 25th of August, uh, 1915. And this was an important day in the life of this man on the slide, whose name was Mir Dast. He was a professional Indian soldier, so he uh, signed up before the war for a career in the military. And by coincidence, he was the brother uh, of Mir Mast, who uh, we met a few minutes ago. And Mir Dast here is most famous uh, for winning the Victoria Cross for his bravery under poison gas attack at Ypres in April 1915. And that summer at the Indian hospitals in England, specifically the Brighton Pavilion Hospital, uh, as here in my uh, next slide, that's in the hospital garden there. So Mir Dast was uh, convalescing that summer for gas and other wounds at the Brighton Pavilion Hospital. And on 25th of August in the hospital garden, he received his VC medal uh, from the hands of George V. And the importance of this is that Brighton was seen as a model hospital for Indian troops, offer, offering state-of-the-art medical care for physical wounds and showing British care of, high, of a high standard proportionate to what the British asked of the Indians on the Western Front. The personal visit of George V uh, was seen as consistent with this, and it was designed to show British gratitude and respect for the Indian soldier in keeping with the high quality of the hospital facilities for physical wounds. And in turn, the Brighton Pavilion Hospital was widely publicized as emblematic of British treatment of Indian troops as colonial subjects. And Mir Dast, uh, shown here on the slide, played a part in this, conducting newspaper interviews in which he spoke gratefully uh, for the medical care uh, he received at Brighton. Now, uh, the meaning of Brighton and the meaning of British, me British medical care for Indian troops in England uh, in the Western Front. So that's of course troops who were wounded uh, on the Western Front and uh, came to England for hospital care. Uh, the meaning of all this I'd suggest is most fully understood by comparing it with British medical care provided on other fronts uh, at the same time. In short, the British medical, medical care on other fronts was not the same in 1915 uh, as it was on the Western Front or for troops wounded on the Western Front. And it's telling that in Iraq or Mesopotamia, as the British uh, tended to call it uh, at the time and often since, uh, it's telling that here in Iraq in, uh, in 1915, 
There were no British photographers to take pictures like the one we have uh, on the slide here. There were no British photographers documenting British treatment of Indian soldiers as was seen at Brighton or other hospitals in England. In Iraq in 1915, there was in fact enormous British neglect uh, for medical care for many reasons that I won't go into now, but the neglect uh, for medical care uh, under British control in Iraq for Indian soldiers and also other troops there uh, reflected that where the British chose not to produce imperial propaganda like this photo we have here, it so happened that their care for the colonial subject could simultaneously uh, be callously cheap. Now for me, a comparison of British medical care on the Western Front and in Iraq in 1915 helped show up the true meanings of the hospital care at Brighton in ways that are perhaps not apparent if the Brighton care uh, is seen in isolation. That's to say, of course, if we connect the medical, medical care in Brighton with care elsewhere, I think we can understand it a little bit better. And for example, I was talking earlier about how we have to be careful in treating the minority of Indian soldiers on the Western Front as somehow uh, general or uh, as having a, had a general experience uh, uh, representing the Indian soldier in the war as a whole. I think medical care is a good example of how we have to be careful there because if we treat, for example, as, as, as has often been done, uh, medical care in Brighton as somehow uh, symbolic of medical care in general, then it's difficult to do that if uh, Iraq uh, is brought into the picture, which I think it has to be to get a truer sense of what was going on in 1915. So that's looking at the Western Front, connecting it with medical care elsewhere uh, to understand what was going on, uh, I think, a little better. And uh, to move on to uh, the next day I, I'm going to uh, touch on today, this is the, uh, the fourth day of five, and this is the 25th of September, uh, 1915. And we've got a picture here, uh, which uh, very kindly uh, was shared with me so that I could use it today of the Battle of uh, Luce. And this is the, this is the picture of, of the ground of Luce rather uh, today. And this was the area where uh, the Indian Corps attacked uh, at Luce on the 25th of September, 1915. Now, often in the BEF offensives of 1915, which the Indian Corps took a full part in, in the first four uh, offensives, starting at Neuve Chapelle in March, at Festibert and Oboe Ridge uh, in May, and then Luce in September. It's often the first day of Neuve Chapelle on the 10th of March who gets the most focus because the Indians played such a big part in that day and it was the first uh, British uh, offensive uh, on, on the Western Front. But I, I, uh, I think that the 25th of September is probably the more significant day uh, for the Indian Corps uh, overall, because it was on that day that the Indian Corps went into battle in a diversionary attack away from the main British attacks. It went into battle as one of the most experienced corps in the BEF, having just been ordered to stay on the Western Front as one of the most experienced uh, corps to stay on the Western Front into 1916, uh, with all the uh, replacements and reinforcements it, it had received from around the world. Its regimental numbers were at a record high, moving up to an average of nearly a thousand compared with 750 uh, in 1914. And at the same time, the, the Indian Corps by then had many experienced officers and it was much better equipped before, now that factories, including in Britain, had started providing war materials, materials for the Indian troops to fight with uh, more than before. And the Indian Corps' attack on the 25th of September 1915 at Luce was really orchestrated by uh, a British officer called Claude Jacob, who was the divisional commander of the Indian division, which led the Indian attack. And he had been born in India and was one of the Indian army's outstanding uh, British officers who had a glittering career later on, uh, going on uh, to become a field marshal and leading uh, much bigger formations in France later on in the war. But it was under the leadership of Claude uh, Jacob who the, the Indian Corps attacked on the 25th of September, uh, 1915. And what's so important about this day is the way that uh, the Indian Corps attacked, the Indian infantry attacked. They had a preliminary bombardment that had various spells that were uh, quite complica complicatedly uh, coordinated over uh, four days before the 25th, which weren't 
uh, which didn't amount to a short bombardment, which the Indian Corps had used before and was to learn it should use again more. But they did use new equipment, uh, such as new heavy radio communication, so that British airplanes could radio artillery reports uh, of shell fall to help achieve greater accuracy than before. Also, the Indian Corps' guns had more, had, uh, were more numerous than, than before in previous uh, offensives. And also, this uh, bombardment I'm talking about on uh, the 25th of September 1915 for the Indian Corps' attack at Luce had a renewed focus on the German uh, front line compared with previous bombardments and the earlier offences I mentioned. It had more guns, it had a better quality of shells, and it also had artillery that was placed uh, in the front Indian trenches to fire, fire point blank at uh, the German line, and it also was supported by a landmine detonation. Such to say that this was a bombardment that had learned lessons from uh, previous attacks to try and improve its power uh, and accuracy. And as a result, the Indian artillery fire at Luce was more successful than it had been at previ in previous Indian uh, attacks on the Western Front, and it wrecked uh, the German front trenches, such that Indian assault troops could penetrate to the third line of the German trenches, which I think was as far as any uh, BEF formation had achieved uh, in the war to that date. And as the Indian troops did this, they went with more firepower in their hands than they'd ever had before, including new French light -like machine guns, they also used new white phosphorus bombs that spewed uh, smoke to screen their advance. And they also wore gas masks, whilst uh, part of the plan was for British gas to be released uh, to poison the Germans uh, for the first time. And in reaching the German third line, uh, so deeper into the German position than, than ever before, the Indian troops uh, followed insistent orders from Claude Japo Jacob, who I mentioned earlier, because part of the problem for him in earlier offensives was not encouraging his troops to go to go quickly enough uh, forward. And at Luce, he emphasized the importance of exploiting success to go through gaps as quickly as possible. And it so happened that the Indian troops didn't have the sophistication of artillery support yet to back them up, uh, to allow them to keep the ground they won at Luce. And so uh, counterattacks pushed them back. But all this uh, technical detail, which uh, you'll have to forgive me for, is really to show that by loose, the Indian Corps really had become one of the most experienced BEF uh, fighting formations and had adapted from earlier offensives where, where it had been less affected, had fewer, few, fewer weapons and, and hadn't won uh, so much ground uh, for however short a time. And the significance of this for the wider world, uh, I'd like to go on to now. And this touches on uh, the last day I'm going to mention, which is the 31st of September, sorry, the 31st of December, 1915. And on that day, there was a report in The Guardian, which we've got here, and the headline is the withdrawal uh, of the Indians, facts about their service in France. And by this point, the Indian infantry in France uh, had been moved away from France and uh, the Indian Corps had been disbanded. And I'll just read out what the newspaper article says. It says, now that the King's message uh, to, the Indian Army, the, to the Indian Army Corps has given the news to the world that this force has been withdrawn from France. It may not be out of place to refer to various rumours which at one time gained currency and which in justice the Indian troops themselves should be effectually uh, disposed of. And it goes on in the, on the next column on the, on the right to talk about the truth of their service is that the Indian Corps did as well as could be reasonably expected and that uh, they had grown war seasoned, it says in the middle of the right hand column. They proved themselves to be first line troops in the fullest uh, meaning of the term. So it was really uh, praising the Indian troops for their performance on the Western fronts, uh, reflecting what I was just saying about how they had developed into a sophisticated fighting force uh, by the time uh, of loose in order to carry out modern attacks where you're combining uh, different weapons along with the troops to create more power than had been achieved before. And what I wanted to really emphasize here is how this newspaper article is really an answer to a lot of myths uh, which have been uh, spread especially in history books over the last hundred years about the poor performance of the Indian troops and I won't go in, into those day into those uh, myths which I discuss uh, at length in in my books but I think given that those myths as this newspaper article indicates are about how the Indian troops didn't perform well and that's why they were moved from France. I think the connections between Luce and the, and the wider world in 1915 
uh, really provides quite a strong answer to that. And what can be missed is how the Indian troops who fought in France went on to fight elsewhere and what they did in doing so. And the ways in which they fought elsewhere showed what they had learned in France and really shows how they've been increasingly effective in France. So in, in this vein, we have, for example, the fourth Gurkhas who moved, I mentioned, from, Gallip from France to Gallipoli in mid-1915. Uh, Once they got to Gallipoli, they used all sorts of skills they'd learned in France, for example, of trench construction, showing how they'd uh, increased uh, their skills uh, in France. And equally, uh, there were Indian units who left France when the Indian Corps was disbanded, uh, who went to East Africa and again, used all sorts of skills there that they had learned uh, in France with one British officer who had served at Ypres and elsewhere uh, in 1915 with the Indian troops, uh, saying of an attack by German troops on his men uh, in East Africa, uh, the Germans must have been very badly informed as to our strength or the quality of troops they had to deal with, he wrote. The Germans came on again and again and we with plenty of machine guns fairly laid them out. My men's France experiences stood them in good stead and they were very cool and collected. Now that quote from East Africa, East Africa gives a sense of troops who had learned a lot in France and were using that knowledge uh, elsewhere in the world after they had left France. And it's the same story as we've heard, it was also at Gallipoli that was going on in Egypt, Iraq and Iran and other places where Indian infantry went from France. They used the fighting skills they had learned uh, on the Western Front. So by, by the end of 1915 into 1916, Indian units were increasingly moving from front to front and forming an emerging global network that was learning uh, and implying uh, lessons. So that brings me to the end of my talk almost. And I'd just like to offer some concluding thoughts in that I hope what I've uh, shared with you today shows how I think the Western Front can be better understood if we connect it uh, with the wider world in many ways. And to move on to my uh, final slide, I'd like to emphasize that in keeping with what I was uh, saying, the Indian part in the First World War is often viewed as a contribution as if it's something that can be looked at discreetly and they contributed a certain number of men to different fronts. But I think we really need to break down barriers between different fronts in the mind and see how they fit together and, and by 1918, both at a senior and more junior level, the uh, Indian regiments and also uh, higher up in, in levels of uh, command and staff, they're full of experienced men who had served in France with the Indian Corps in uh, 1915. And this picture here uh, we have of, of the men on yaks is one example. Most of these men were veterans of France in 1915. And here they are uh, serving uh, in Central Asia in, uh, in 1918. But they're examples, and they, they're examples all around the network that I was describing earlier, the global network of Indian armed forces, of how the experience in France in 1915 was then used elsewhere, had made men better soldiers and more skilled. And that really reflects how ideas that the Indian soldiers in, in France were somehow wanting or weren't adequate for the purposes of the Western Front. It really shows how that just isn't true they, they adapted to France and the circumstances there, and they're able to use that experience uh, elsewhere, as I hope I've been able to show. So thank you very much uh, for, uh, yeah, for, for joining us. Th thanks very much. Thanks um, for that, uh, George, Antonia, and, and Bill. That were, those were three excellent uh, presentations. In, in, the, uh, in the usual way, perhaps we can uh, raise our hands as a, as a silence, but nevertheless heartfelt appreciation of, of the work uh, that's been uh, done by, by the, our three speakers in, in uh, entertaining us this afternoon. And I know you can't see these, but there is a, 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 a concophony of hands going up if uh, that makes them better. But, uh, so you can um, virtually hear, hopefully, the, the round of applause. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's the Q&A time. So, um, first question uh, from um, Chris... Uh, sorry, I can't pronounce his surname, Karnag. Canagan. Approximately what percentage of the Indian army troops who deserted or mutinied were Muslims as opposed to Hindus or Sikhs or any other religion? Do, do we know any, uh, any any statistics around that, George? Um, George. Uh, we do. It's 
it, 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 earlier in the war, there tend to be more Muslims, but later in the war, I would say uh, they, they perhaps belong more to other religions. And yeah, with, uh, with mutinies, I, I think it's the most obvious ones in 1915 are Muslim uh, mutineers, and that's the same in 1916. So yeah, units that positively mutiny uh, do tend to be Muslim, yes. And is that reflected in the in the percentage of, of Muslim troops versus Hindus, or, or, or is it? Uh... Uh, I think it's. So how, how how do you mean in that sense? Sorry, it, 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 we, we, if if the majority were, were Muslim ethnicity, was the majority of the army Muslim, or, or, or is that? Uh, uh, no, I, I think it, it's it's an area that needs more uh, research, frankly, as in the to try and gauge uh, levels of acts of resistance and uh, what community backgrounds people came from. And I think that that kind of issue is a good example of how it's something which is over the last hundred years, if we look at First World War history as a big thing, I think it's uh, something which could do with more research. Super, th thanks. Got two questions um, which are similar, but slightly different so I'm going to run two questions together one from Chris Carrigan and one from James Goulty so um, this is for George. Um, in Mesopotamia was the medical care provided to the Indian army personnel different from and are less good than provided to the British personnel and then linked to that is from James did the medical system in Iraq treat Indian troops especially badly compared with others I thought medical service in Iraq were pretty poor for all, regardless of background, race, etc. So similar questions there from a couple of our of our viewers, George. Yeah, I, I think those are, are great questions, and this is also another area that needs uh, more research. In that, I, I think exactly what happened in in, uh, in Mesopotamia or Iraq in 1915 uh, hasn't been fully explained e even yet. Um, if we look at what what the different sorts of troops actually experienced. And I tried to be careful earlier because I'm aware of this issue of saying that there were other troops in Iraq as well who received uh, negligent me me medical care, if we can put it that way. And I think there were differences uh, at times, such as sometimes British troops were given preference, so they might have received medical treatment first or given a more comfortable space to be if they were wounded, say, given a place on a bed in a boat rather than being left just to lie on the open deck. So there was that kind of difference. But on the whole, the uh, medical treatment in uh, Iraq, the British and the Indian troops both shared uh, the, you know, the unfortunate position of uh, receiving uh, often terrible uh, medical care compared to uh, the Western Front. But I think it's quite telling that it's really the British troops complaining or saying how terrible the medical care is in Iraq that brings it to public attention, which then brings about change in the way that change happened from late 1915 into early 1916. And so it's really uh, not the Indians who are being uh, looked at as closely as the British in, in terms of how they're suffering. And I think that reflects that there are real issues about uh, race in the medical treatment that we see in Iraq in 1915 in particular. And I think on one hand we can say, but there were British troops there as well. But on the other hand, I think a wider question that needs to be looked at more uh, is how the Indians were, were treated themselves and how there might have been differences and how there might have been similarities, because it, it's, it's, it's quite a complicated area. Thanks. Um, George, a, a pair of questions here coming in, which are, are pretty much linked. Richard Olson asks, one VC and one mutineer from the same Indian family, how close had, been, had they been and what happened first? And that pretty similar to Steve Mason's question, um, was there any comment made at the time regarding the, the two Mer brothers, one were in the VC and the other deserting? So a couple of questions there about, about the anecdote you told us about the two brothers. Yeah, well, I've, I've, I've looked into their stories uh, quite deeply, actually, including in, in my recent book, um, The Indian Empire at War. And what I, where I really end up with this is, is thinking that the brothers are really much more similar uh, than different. And I think to treat them as one has a VC and, and looks quite loyal and the other's a deserter is, is, is quite an imperialistic point of view in many ways because it's absorbing what the main British messages uh, were about the two. 
Whereas in reality, uh, there's evidence that puts it beyond doubt in my mind that the, the, the brother who won the VC deserted in 1917, so that both brothers deserted British service. And if we look at it in the other way, uh, the brother who's known for deserting uh, was awarded a medal for bravery uh, in 1914. So they're both decorated for bravery and they both deserted in my mind. Um, as to their personal closeness, I think they were quite close. There's very good evidence that uh, in 1916, 1917, uh, they're living together for a bit and they're both back home um, in the uh, frontier areas of, uh, on the edge of Africa, southern Afghanistan. And uh, so not so much is known about their personal relationship, but they do seem to be quite close. Uh, it, I've seen it written that they were on the Western Front at the same time or they came across each other. I, I don't think there's any credible uh, evidence at all for that. I think uh, they didn't see each other on the Western Front and there's no evidence that they were in touch there. Um, but overall, I think their brothers who we should really see is, is much more similar. And I think we, we need to look quite carefully at the storylines that make us perceive them uh, as being different sorts of person because um, I'm, I'm not sure about that at all. Okay, th th thanks for that, um, George. Right, um, nearly up against the time limit now, but we've probably got time for just a couple of quick questions here. Um, John Lloyd asks, and this is for George, uh, what part did caste and religious differences hamper or assist cooperation with the colonial perspective? I think the, uh, the British were quite careful to allow the Indian troops to practice things like religion. And I'd say that given the, the, the scale of, of forces, for example, on, on the Western Front by late 1915, the fact that um, Indian Muslim troops uh, were, were allowed uh, to observe Ramadan uh, without going into battle, uh, that was an example of, of how, on one hand, uh, their uh, religion could be uh, respected, and uh, on the other hand, uh, the BEF could carry on fighting because it had so many other men. And by that point, the, the Indians were um, quite a small minority of the BEF, having been uh, around a third in late uh, October 1914. So I think uh, operationally, it's not really um, a practical problem. Uh, I think the, the British managed to, to show respect uh, in many ways for uh, Indian religious pr practices, as it were. And it's... Uh, it's really uh, something that the Indian Army had long been able to balance and was going on campaign and uh, having, having people practice uh, their religions. And I think there are multiple campaigns uh, before 1914 where you can have similar problems to do with how do you do, the, do this or that in accordance with a particular religion whilst you're on campaign. And it had been something that the Indian Army had, had managed uh, since its foundation. Okay, thanks for that, uh, George. Um, Gary, we're up, we're up to four o'clock already. It's uh, the old adage of time flying when you're enjoying yourself, but I am conscious that we have hit the uh, hit the four o'clock mark. Um, I don't know if you want to uh, sum up or, or ask any questions or draw any conclusions, uh, Gary. Well, I, I can't possibly sum up, um, but I just have a few stray thoughts which might help to bring the staff news um, proceedings together. I mean, this morning I, I, I said that it struck me that 1915 is all about it being a transition, transitional year. That it is both the end of the beginning, as in moving from mobile warfare into static warfare, well, that's, that's the, the tail end of it anyway, uh, but also it's, it's learning that the war is going to be rather different from that has been prepared for before the war. And so 1915 is uh, a year in which you see the beginning, if not of the end, at least the beginning of the middle as well. So it's a it, rather trite thing to say, but it, it is a bridge between the opening stages of the war and the deep attritional, at least form of war, at least, at least, at least on, on the Western Front. The other point I, I guess I could make is that all three papers in different ways have touched upon the way in which 1915 is a critical stage in the development of, of total war for Britain and, and, and the British Empire. That um, in the case of India and Canada and the use of woman power, these are expansions on ideas which either didn't exist before the war or they're simply 
in embryo. I, don't, I think if you take them from the perspective of the three subjects, looking back uh, from the end of 1915, nobody two years before would have, would have, would have believed that that would have happened in, in, in the course of the year. Another thing which comes out loud and clear, particularly from, well, actually from, from Antonia and George's um, talks in particular, are mentalities. And something which certainly has been an eye-opener to me over the last few years is to, just to get our heads around the way that people thought then, which is either different from the way we think now, or now we are thinking differently. We're starting to sort of differentiate um, various strands of thought. So <clears throat> I think that in, in, in terms of the, the Indians, Indian soldiers, British um, rule, uh, generals, British, British, British commanders, I think actually had, you know, uh, sp split views on it. I mean, they both feared Indian troops, I think, as we've come across, you know, that um, the shadow of the mutiny of 1857 was never entirely from their memory, while admiring them simultaneously. And this is a mixture of straightforward, you know, racial thought, but a whole other lot of, lot of cultural baggage, which is, which is quite difficult for us to get our heads around today because we have moved beyond it, or we've moved beyond it in some ways anyway. Same way as uh, An Antonia's um, stuff about women, women. I mean, no one bats an eyelid these days if you see a woman doctor or a woman surgeon. Trying to think our way back into the mindset of 1915, however, is a really big jump. And so that's something just, just to, 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 to finish up with. It's something which I think we all have to engage with when we look at events which are now 100 plus years ago. I've made this point before, but I think we still fall into the trap of thinking about the First World War as being current affairs because it is just beyond living memory, living memory for some anyway. And in many ways, people seem quite similar to us. Actually, they thought very differently. And unless we get our heads around that, it's difficult to, to put the events of hundreds of years ago into a proper historical perspective. And all three papers today in different ways, I think helped us to come to terms with, we are talking about historical events, not contemporary events. Great. Well, th th thanks for that. And thanks for the um, three papers, um, George, Antonia and, and, and Bill, um, and, and together with the, th the three speakers from this morning. Um, we, we've certainly been uh, entertained and educated, I believe, um, during the course of uh, two, uh, two hour sessions. Uh, I hope everybody's enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, if we'd like to just to do a final silent round of applause, um, for uh, not only the three afternoon speakers, but the three morning speakers as well. That's splendid. I can confirm that there's a, a hands going up as, as a round of applause. Um, and on that note, I think we'll uh, call, that, call that a day. So um, thanks to, to all three. Thanks to Gary for, for uh, presiding over this, uh, presiding as president. Um, and um, I think uh, that's, uh, that's all, for, all from me. So thanks very much. Mademoiselle from Lord.